Greylorn by Keith Lawmer, read by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Greylorn, Chapter One Prologue the murmur of conversation around the conference table died as the world secretary entered the room and took his place at the head of the table. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said, "'I'll not detain you with formalities today. The representative of the Navy Department is waiting outside to present the case for his proposal. You all know something of the scheme. It has been heard and passed as feasible by the advisory group. It will now be our responsibility to make the decision.' I ask that each of you in forming a conclusion remember that our present situation can only be described as desperate, and that desperate measures may be in order." The secretary turned and nodded to a braided admiral seated near the door, who left the room and returned a moment later with a young, gray-haired naval officer. "'Members of the Council,' said the admiral, "'this is Lieutenant Commander Greylorn. All eyes followed the officer as he walked the length of the room to take the empty seat at the end of the table. "'Please proceed, Commander,' said the secretary. "'Thank you, Mr. Secretary,' the commander's voice was unhurried and low, yet it carried clearly and held authority. He began without preliminary. When the world government dispatched the scouting forces forty-three years ago, an effort was made to contact each of the twenty-five worlds to which this government had sent colonization parties during the colonial era of the middle twentieth centuries. With the return of the last of the scouts early this year, we are forced to realize that no assistance would be forthcoming from that source." The commander turned his eyes to the world map covering the wall. With the exception of North America and a narrow strip of coastal waters, the entire map was tinted an unhealthy pink. The latest figures compiled by the Department of the Navy indicate that we are losing area at the rate of one square mile every twenty-one hours. The organism's faculty for developing resistance to our chemical and biological measures appears to be evolving rapidly. Analyses of atmospheric samples indicate the level of noxious content rising at a steady rate. In other words, in spite of our best efforts, we are not holding our own against the red tide." A mutter ran around the table as members shifted uncomfortably in their seats. A great deal of thought has been applied to the problem of increasing our offensive ability. This in the end is still a question of manpower and raw resources. We do not have enough. Our small improvements in effectiveness have been progressively offset by increasing casualties and the loss of territory. In the end, alone, we must lose." The commander paused as the murmur rose and died again. "'There is, however, one possibility still unexplored,' he said. And recent work done at the Polar Research Station places the possibility well within the scope of feasibility. At the time the attempt was made to establish contact with the colonies, one was omitted. It alone now remains to be sought out. I refer to the Omega Colony." A portly member leaned forward and burst out, "'The location of the colony is unknown!' The secretary intervened. "'Please permit the commander to complete his remarks. There will be ample opportunity for discussion when he has finished. This contact was not attempted for two reasons, the commander continued. First, the precise location was not known. Second, the distance was at least twice that of the earlier colonies. At the time, there was a feeling of optimism which seemed to make the attempt superfluous. Now, the situation has changed. The possibility of contacting Omega Colony now assumes paramount importance. The development of which I spoke is a new application of drive principle, which has given to us a greatly improved effective velocity for space propulsion. Forty years ago, 
the minimum elapsed time of return travel to the presumed sector within which the Omega world should lie was about a century. Today we have the techniques to construct a small scouting vessel capable of making the transit in just over five years. We cannot hold out here for a century, perhaps, but we can manage a decade. As for location, we know the initial target point toward which Omega was launched. The plan was, of course, that a precise target should be selected by the crew after approaching the star group closely enough to permit telescopic planetary resolution and study. There is no reason why the crew of a scout could not make the same study and examination of possible targets, and, with luck, find the colony. Omega was the last colonial venture undertaken by our people two centuries after the others. It was the best equipped and largest expedition of them all. It was not limited to one destination, little known, but had a presumably large selection of potentials from which to choose, and her planetary study facilities were extremely advanced. I have full confidence that Omega made a successful planetfall and has by now established a vigorous new society. Honorable Members of the Council, I submit that all the resources of this government should be at once placed at the disposal of a task force with the assigned duty of constructing a fifty-thousand-ton scouting vessel, and conducting an exhaustive survey of a volume of space of one thousand AUs centered on the so-called Omega Cluster. The world secretary interrupted the babble which arose with the completion of the officer's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, time is of the essence of our problem. Let's proceed at once to orderly interrogation. Mr. Clayle, lead off, please. The portly counselor glared at the commander. The undertaking you propose, sir, will require a massive diversion of our capacities from defense. That means losing ground at an increasing rate to the obscenity crawling over our planet. That same potential applied to direct offensive measures may yet turn the balance in our favor. Against this, the possibility of a scouting party stumbling over the remains of a colony the location of which is almost completely problematical and by which analogy, with all of the earlier colonial attempts, has at best managed to survive as a marginal foothold, is so fantastically remote as to be inconsiderable. The commander listened coolly, seriously. Mr. Counselor, he replied, as to our defensive measures, we have passed the point of diminishing returns. We have more knowledge now than we are capable of employing against the plague. Had we not neglected the physical sciences as we have for the last two centuries, we might have developed adequate measures before we had been so far reduced in numbers and area as to be unable to produce and employ the new weapons our laboratories have belatedly developed. Now we must be realistic. There is no hope in that direction. As to the location of the Omega world, our plan is based on the fact that the selection was not made at random. Our scout will proceed along the Omega course line, as known to us from the observations which were carried on for almost three years after its departure. We propose to continue on that line, carrying out systematic observation of each potential sun in turn. As we detect planets, we will alter course only as necessary to satisfy ourselves as to the possibility of suitability of the planet. We can safely assume that Omega will not have bypassed any likely target. If we should have more than one prospect under consideration at any time, we shall examine them in turn. If the Omega world has developed successfully, ample evidence should be discernible at a distance." Clayle muttered, Madness! and subsided. The angular member on his left spoke gently. Mr. Greylorn, why, if this colonial venture has met with the success you assume, has its government not re-established contact with the mother world during the last two centuries? On that score, Mr. Counselor, we can only conjecture, the commander said. 
the outward voyage may have required as much as fifty or sixty years. After that, there must have followed a lengthy period of development and expansion in building the new world. It is not to be expected that the pioneers would be ready to expend resources in expeditionary ventures for some time. I do not completely understand your apparent confidence in the ability of the hypothetical Omega culture to supply massive aid to us, even if its people should be so inclined," said a straight-backed woman member. The time seems very short for the mastery of an alien world. The population development plan, madam, provided for an increase from the original ten thousand colonists to approximately forty thousand within twenty years, after which the rate of increase would of course rapidly grow. Assuming sixty years for planet fall, the population should now number over one hundred sixty millions. Given population, all else follows. Two hours later, the world's secretary summed up. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the facts before us. There still exist differences in interpretation, which, however, will not be resolved by continued repetition. I now call for a vote on the resolution proposed by the military member and presented by Commander Greylorn. There was silence in the council chamber as the votes were recorded and tabulated. Then the world secretary sighed softly. Commander, he said, the Council has approved the resolution. I am sure that there will be general agreement that you will be placed at the head of the project, since you were director of the team which developed the new drive, and are also the author of the plan. I wish you the best of luck." He rose and extended his hand. The first keel plate of the armed courier vessel Galahad was laid thirty-two hours later. Chapter 1 I expected trouble when I left the bridge. The tension that had been building for many weeks was ready for release in violence. The ship was silent as I moved along the passageway. Oddly silent, I thought. Something was brewing. I stopped before the door of my cabin, listening. Then I put my ear to the wall. I caught the faintest sounds from within, a muffled click, voices. Someone was inside, someone attempting to be very quiet. I was not overly surprised. Sooner or later the trouble had had to come into the open. I looked up the passage, dim in the green glow of the nightlights. There was no one in sight. I listened. There were three voices, too faint to identify. The clever thing for me to do now would be to walk back up to the bridge, and order the provost marshal to clear my cabin. But I had an intuitive feeling that that was not the way to handle the situation. It would make things much simpler all around if I could push through this with as little commotion as possible. There was no point in waiting. I took out my key and placed it soundlessly in the slot. As the door slid back, I stepped briskly into the room. Kramer, the medical officer, and Joyce, assistant communications officer, stood awkwardly surprised. Fine, the supply officer, was sprawled on my bunk. He sat up quickly. They were a choice selection. Two of them were wearing sidearms. I wondered if they were ready to use them or if they knew just how far they were prepared to go. My task would be to keep them from finding out. I avoided looking surprised. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' I said cheerfully. I stepped to the liquor cabinet, opened it, poured scotch into a glass. "'Join me in a drink?' I said. None of them answered. I sat down. I had to move just a little faster than they did, and by holding the initiative keep them off balance. They had counted on hearing my approach, having a few moments to get set, and using my surprise against me. I had reversed their play and taken the advantage. How long I could keep it depended on how well I played my few cards. I plunged ahead. 
as I saw Kramer take a breath and wrinkle his brow, about to make his pitch. "'The men need a change, a break in the monotony,' I said. "'I've been considering a number of possibilities.' I fixed my eyes on Fine as I talked. He sat stiffly on the edge of my bunk. Already he was regretting his boldness in presuming to rumple the captain's bed. "'It might be a good bit of drill to set up a few live missile runs on random targets,' I said. "'There's also the possibility of setting up a small arms range and qualifying all hands.' I switched my eyes to Kramer. Fine was sorry he'd come, and Joyce wouldn't take the initiative. Kramer was my problem. "'I see you have your Mark IX, Major,' I said, holding out my hand. "'May I see it?' I smiled pleasantly. I hoped I had hit him quickly and smoothly enough before he had had time to adjust to the situation. Even for a hard operator like Kramer, it took mental preparation to openly defy his commander, particularly in casual conversation. But possession of the weapon was more than casual. I looked at him, smiling, my hand held out. He wasn't ready. He pulled the pistol from its case, handed it to me. I flipped the chamber open, glanced at the charge indicator, checked the action. Nice weapon, I said. I laid it on the open bar at my right. Joyce opened his mouth to speak. I cut in the same firm snappy tone I used on the bridge. Let me see yours, Lieutenant. He flushed looked at Kramer, then passed the pistol over without a word. I took it, turned it over thoughtfully, and then rose, holding it negligently by the grip. Now, if you gentlemen don't mind, I have a few things to attend to. I was not smiling. I looked at Kramer with expressionless eyes. I think we'd better keep our little chat confidential for the present. I think I can promise you action in the near future, though." They filed out, looking as foolish as three preachers caught in a raid on a brothel. I stood without moving until the door closed. Then I let my breath out. I sat down and finished off the scotch in one drag. "'You were a lucky boy,' I said aloud. Three gutless wonders. I looked at the Mark Nines on the table. A blast from one of those would have burned all four of us in that enclosed room. I dumped them into a drawer and loaded my Browning two-millimeter. The trouble wasn't over yet, I knew. After this farce, Kramer would have to make another move to regain his prestige. I unlocked the door and left it slightly ajar. Then I threw the main switch and stretched out on my bunk. I put the browning needler on the little shelf near my right hand. Perhaps I had made a mistake, I reflected, in eliminating formal discipline as far as possible in the shipboard routine. It had seemed the best course for a long cruise under the present conditions, but now I had a morale situation that could explode in mutiny at the first blunder on my part. I knew that Kramer was the focal point of the trouble. He was my senior staff officer, and carried a great deal of weight in the officer's mess. As a medic, he knew most of the crew better than I. I thought I knew Kramer's driving motive, too. He had always been a great success with the women. When he had volunteered for the mission, he had doubtless pictured himself as quite a romantic hero, off on a noble but hopeless quest. Now, after four years in deep space, he was beginning to realize that he was getting no younger, and that at best he would have to spend a decade of his prime in monastic seclusion. He wanted to go back now and salvage what he could. It was incredible to me that this movement could have gathered followers, but I had to face the fact. My crew, almost to a man, had given up the search before it was well begun. I had heard the first rumors only a few weeks before, but the idea had spread through the crew like wildfire. Now I couldn't afford drastic action, or risk forcing a blow-up by arresting ringleaders. I had to baby the situation along with an easy hand, and hope for good news from the survey section. 
a likely find now, would save us. There was still every reason to hope for success in our search. To date, all had gone according to plan. We had followed the route of Omega as far as it had been charted, and then gone on, studying the stars ahead for evidence of planets. We had made our first finds early in the fourth year of the voyage. It had been a long, tedious time since then of study and observation, eliminating one world after another as too massive, too cold, too close to a blazing primary, too small to hold an atmosphere. In all, we had discovered twelve planets, of four suns. Only one had looked good enough for close observation. We had moved into televideo range before realizing it was an all-sea world. Now we had five new main-sequence suns ahead within six months' range. I hoped for a confirmation on a planet at any time. To turn back now to a world that had pinned its last hopes on our success was unthinkable. Yet this was Kramer's plan, and that of his followers. They would not prevail while I lived. Still, it was not my plan to be a party to our failure through martyrdom. I intended to stay alive and carry through to success. I dozed lightly and waited. I awoke when they tried the door. It had swung open a few inches at the touch of the one who had tried it, not expecting it to be unlatched. It stood ajar now, the pale light from the hall shining on the floor. No one entered. Kramer was still fumbling, unsure of himself. At every surprise with which I presented him he was paralyzed, expecting a trap. Several minutes passed in tense silence. Then the door swung wider. "'I'll be forced to kill the first man who enters this room,' I said in a steady voice. I hadn't picked up the gun. I heard urgent whispers in the hall. Then a hand reached in behind the shelter of the door and flipped the light switch. Nothing happened, since I had opened the main switch. It was only a small discomfiture, but it had the effect of interfering with their plan of action, such as it was. These men were being pushed along by Kramer, without a clearly thought-out plan. They hardly knew how to go about defying lawful authority. I called out, "'I suggest you call this nonsense off now, and go back to your quarters, men. I don't know who is involved in this yet. You can get away clean if you leave quietly, now, before you've made a serious mistake." I hoped it would work. This little adventure, abortive though it was, might serve to let off steam. The men would have something to talk about for a few precious days. I picked up the needler and waited. If the bluff failed, I would have to kill someone. Distantly I heard a metallic clatter. Moments later a tremor rattled the objects on the shelf, followed a few seconds later by a heavy shuddering. Papers slid from my desk, fluttered across the floor. The whiskey bottle toppled, rolled to the far wall. I felt dizzy, as my bunk seemed to tilt under me. I reached for the intercom key and flipped it. "'Taylor,' I said, "'this is the captain. What's the report?' There was a momentary delay before the answer came. "'Captain, we've taken a meteor strike aft, apparently a metallic body. It must have hit us a tremendous wallop, because it set up a rotation. I've called out damage control.' "'Good work, Taylor,' I said. I keyed for stores. The object must have hit about there. "'This is the captain,' I said. "'Any damage there?' I got a hum of background noise then a too-close transmission. "'Uh, Cap'n, we've got a hole in the aft bulkhead here. I slapped a seat pad over it. Man, that could have killed somebody!' I flipped off the intercom and started aft at a run. My visitors had evaporated. In the passage men stood, milled, called questions. I keyed my mic as I ran. "'Taylor, order all hands to emergency stations!' It was difficult running, since the floors had assumed an apparent tilt. Loose gear was rolling and sliding along underfoot, propelled forward by centrifugal force. 
Aft of stores, I heard the whistle of escaping air and high-pressure gases from ruptured lines. Vapor clouds fogged the air. I called for floodlights for the whole sector. Clay appeared out of the fog with his damage control crew. Sir, he said, it's punctured inner and outer shells in two places, and fragments have riddled the whole sector. There are at least three men dead and two hurt. Taylor, I called. Let's have another damage control crew back here on the triple. Get the medics back here, too. Clay and his men had put on masks and moved off. I borrowed one from a man standing by and followed. The large exit puncture was in the forward cargo lock. The room was sealed off, limiting the air loss. Clay, I said, pass this up for the moment and get that entry puncture sealed. I'll put the extra crew in suits to handle this. I moved back into clear air and called for reports from all sectors. The worst of the damage was in the auxiliary power control room, where communication and power lines were slashed and the panel cut up. The danger of serious damage to essential equipment had been very close, but we had been lucky. This was the first instance I had heard of encountering an object at hyper-light speed. It was astonishing how this threat to our safety cleared the air. The men went about their duties more cheerfully than they had for months, and Kramer was conspicuous by his subdued air. The emergency had re-established at least for the time the normal discipline. The men still relied on the captain in trouble. Damage control crews worked steadily for the next seventy-two hours, replacing wiring, welding, and testing. Power section jockeyed endlessly, correcting air motions. Meanwhile, I checked almost hourly with survey section, hoping for good news to consolidate the improved morale situation. It was on Sunday morning, just after dawn relief, that Lieutenant Taylor came up to the bridge, looking sick. Sir, he said, we took more damage than we knew with that meteor strike. He stopped and swallowed hard. What have you got, Lieutenant? I said. We missed a piece. It must have gone off on a tangent through stores into the cooler, clipped the coolant line, and let warm air in. All the fresh, frozen stuff is contaminated and rotten. He gagged. I got a whiff of it, sir. Excuse me. He rushed away. This was calamity. We didn't carry much in the way of fresh, natural food, but what we had was vital. It was a bulky, delicate cargo to handle, but the chemists hadn't yet come up with synthetics to fill all the dietary needs of man. We could get by fine for a long time on vitamin tablets and concentrates, but there were nutritional elements that you couldn't get that way. Hydroponics didn't help. We had to have a few ounces of fresh meat and vegetables grown in sunlight every week, or start to die within months. I knew that Kramer wouldn't let this chance pass. As medical officer, he would be well within his rights in calling to my attention the fact that our health would soon begin to suffer. I felt sure he would do so as loudly and publicly as possible at the first opportunity. My best move was to beat him to the punch by making a general announcement, giving the facts in the best possible light. That might take some of the sting out of anything Kramer said later. I gave it to them, short and to the point. Men, we've just suffered a serious loss. All the fresh frozen stores are gone. That doesn't mean we'll be going on short rations. There are plenty of concentrates and vitamins aboard. But it does mean we're going to be suffering from deficiencies in our diet. We didn't come out here on a pleasure cruise. We're on a mission that leaves no room for failure. This is just one more fact for us to face. Now let's get on with the job." I walked into the wardroom, drew a cup of near coffee, and sat down. The screen showed a beach with booming surf. The soundtrack picked up the crash and hiss of the breakers. Considering the red plague that now covered the scene, I thought it was a poor choice. I dialed for a high view of rolling farmland. Mannion sat at a table across the room with Kirschenbaum. They were hunched over their cups, not talking. I wondered where they stood. 
Mannion, communications officer, was neurotic, but an old armed force man. Discipline meant a lot to him. Kirschenbaum, power chief, was a joker, with cold eyes, and smarter than he seemed. The question was whether he was smart enough to idealize the stupidity of retreat now. Kramer walked in, not wasting any time. He saw me and came over. He stopped a few feet from the table and said loudly, "'Captain, I'd like to know your plans now that the possibility of continuing is out.' I sipped my near coffee and looked at the rolling farmland. I didn't answer him. If I could get him mad, I could take him at his game. Kramer turned red. He didn't like being ignored. The two at the other table were watching. "'Captain,' Kramer said loudly, "'as medical officer, I have to know what measures you're taking to protect the health of the men.' This was a little better. He was on the defensive now, explaining why he had a right to question his commander. I wanted him a little hotter, though. I looked up at him. "'Kramer,' I said in a clear, not-too-loud voice, "'you're on watch. I don't want to find you hanging around the wardroom making light chit-chat until you're properly relieved from duty.' I went back to my near coffee and the farmland. A river was in view now, and beyond it distant mountains. Kramer was furious. "'Joyce has relieved me, Captain,' he said, controlling his voice with an effort. "'I felt I'd better take this matter up with you as soon as possible, since it affects the health of every man aboard.' He was trying to keep cool, in command of himself. "'I haven't authorized any changes in the duty roster, Major,' I said mildly. "'Report to your post.' I was riding the habit of discipline now as far as it would carry me. I hope that disobedience to a direct order, solidly based on regulations, was a little too big a jump for Kramer at the moment. Tomorrow it might be different. But it was essential that I break up the scene he was staging. He wilted. "'I'll see you at 1700 in the chart-room, Kramer,' I said as he turned away. Mannion and Kirschenbaum looked at each other, then finished their near coffee hurriedly and left. I hoped their version of the incident would help deflate Kramer's standing among the malcontents. I left the wardroom and took the lift up to the bridge and checked with Clay and his survey team. "'I think I've spotted a slight perturbation in Delta Three, Captain,' Clay said. "'I'm not sure. We're still pretty far out.' "'All right, Clay,' I said. "'Stay with it.' Clay was one of my more dependable men, dedicated to his work. Unfortunately, he was no man of action. He would have little influence in a showdown. I was at the Schmidt when I heard the lift open. I turned. Kramer, Fine, Taylor, and a half a dozen enlisted crew chiefs crowded out, bunched together. They were all wearing needlers. At least they learned that much, I thought. Kramer moved forward. "'We feel that the question of the men's welfare has to be dealt with right away, Captain,' he said smoothly. I looked at him coldly, glanced at the rest of his crew. I said nothing. "'What we're faced with is pretty grim, even if we turn back now. I can't be responsible for the results if there's any delay,' Kramer said. He spoke in an arrogant tone. I looked them over. Let the silence build. "'You're in charge of this menagerie,' I said, looking at Kramer. "'If so, you've got thirty seconds to send them back to their kennels. We'll go into the matter of unauthorized personnel on the bridge later. As for you, Major, you can consider yourself under arrest in quarters. Now move.' Kramer was ready to stare me down, but Fine gave me a break by tugging at his sleeve. Kramer shook him loose, snarling. At that the crew chiefs faded back into the lift. Fine and Taylor hesitated, then joined them. Kramer started to shout after them, then got hold of himself. The lift moved down. Kramer thought about going for his needler. I looked at him through narrowed eyes. 
he decided to rely on his mouth as usual. He licked his lips. "'All right, I'm under arrest,' he said. "'But as medical officer of this vessel, it's my duty to remind you that you can't live without a certain minimum of fresh organic food. We've got to start back now.' He was pale, but determined. He couldn't bear the thought of getting bald and toothless from dietary deficiency. The girls would never give him another look. "'We're going on, Kramer,' I said. "'As long as we have a man aboard still able to move. Teeth or no teeth.' "'Deficiency disease is no joke, Captain,' Kramer said. "'You can get all the symptoms of leprosy, cancer, and syphilis just by skipping a few necessary elements in your diet and we're missing most of them. "'Giving me your opinions is one thing, Kramer,' I said. "'Mutiny is another.' Clay stood beside the main screen, wide-eyed. I couldn't send Kramer down under his guard. "'Let's go, Kramer,' I said. "'I'm locking you up myself.' We rode down in the lift. The men who had been with Kramer stood awkwardly, silent as we stepped out into the passage. I spotted two chronic troublemakers among them. I thought I might as well call them now as later. "'Williams and Nagel,' I said. "'This officer is under arrest. Escort him to his quarters and lock him in.' As they stepped forward hesitantly, Kramer said, "'Keep your filthy hooks off me.' He started down the passage. If I could get Kramer put away before anybody else started trouble, I might be able to bluff it through. I followed him and his two sheepish guards down past the power station and the mess. I hoped there would be no crowd there to see their hero, Kramer, under guard. I was out of luck. Apparently word had gone out of Kramer's arrest, and the corridor was clogged with men. They stood unmoving as we approached. Kramer stopped. "'Clear this passage, you men,' I said. Slowly they began to move back, giving ground reluctantly. Suddenly Kramer shouted, "'That's right, you whiners and complainers! Clear the way so the captain can take me back to the missile deck and shoot me! You just want to talk about home! You haven't got the guts to do anything about it!' The moving mass halted, milled. Someone shouted, "'Who's he think he is, anyway?' Kramer whirled toward me. "'He thinks he's the man who's going to let you all rot alive to save his record.' "'Williams, Nagel,' I said loudly, "'clear this passage.' Williams started half-heartedly to shove at the men nearest him. A fist flashed out and snapped his head back. That was a mistake. Williams pulled his needler and fired a ricochet down the passage. "'About twelve of you yellow bellies get out of my way!' he yelled. "'I'm coming through!' Nagel moved close to Williams and shouted something to him. The noise drowned it. Kramer swung back to me, frantic to regain his sway over the mob. "'Once I'm out of the way, there'll be a general purge!' he roared. The hubbub faded as men turned to hear him. You're all marked men. He's gone mad. He won't let one of you live. Kramer had their eyes now. Take him now, he shouted, and seized my arm to begin the action. He'd rushed it a little. I hit him across the face with the back of my hand. No one jumped to his assistance. I drew my two-millimeter. If you ever lay a hand on your commanding officer again, I'll burn you where you stand, Kramer. Then a voice came from behind me. "'You're not killing anybody without a trial, Captain!' Joyce stood there with two of the crew chiefs, needler in hand. Fine and Taylor were not in sight. I pushed Kramer out of my way and walked up to Joyce. "'Hand me that weapon, Junior, but first, I said. I looked him in the eye with all the glare I had. He stepped back a pace. "'Why don't you jump him?' he called to the crowd. The wall enunciator hummed and spoke. "'Captain Greylorn, please report to the bridge. Unidentified body on the main scope.' 
Every man stopped in his tracks, listening. The annunciator continued, "'Looks like it's decelerating, Captain.' I holstered my pistol, pushed past Joyce, and trotted for the lift. The mob behind me broke up, talking, as men under long habit ran for action stations. Clay was operating calmly under pressure. He sat at the main screen and studied the blip, making tiny crayon marks. "'She's too far out for a reliable scanner track, Captain,' he said. "'But I'm pretty sure she's breaking.' If that were true, this might be the break we'd been living for. Only manned or controlled bodies decelerated in deep space. "'How did you spot it, Clay?' I asked. Picking up a tiny mass like this was a delicate job, even when you knew its coordinates. "'Just happened to catch my eye, Captain,' he said. I always make a general check every watch of the whole forward quadrant. I noticed a blip where I didn't remember seeing one before. "'You've got quite an eye, Clay,' I said. "'How about getting this object in the beam?' "'We're trying now, Captain,' he said. "'That's a mighty small field, though.' Joyce called from the radar board. "'I think I'm getting an echo at fifteen thousand, sir. It's pretty weak.' Miller, quiet and meticulous, delicately tuned the beam control. "'Give me your fix, Joyce,' he said. "'I can't find it.' Joyce called out his figures, in seconds of arc to three places. "'You're right on it, Joyce,' Miller called a minute later. "'I got it. Now pray it don't get away when I boost it.' Clay stepped over behind Miller. "'Take it a few mags at a time,' he said calmly. I watched Miller's screen. A tiny point near the center of the screen swelled to a speck, and jumped nearly off the screen to the left. Miller centered it again and switched to a higher power. This time it jumped less, and resolved into two tiny dots. Step by step, the magnification was increased as ring after ring of the lens antenna was thrown into play. Each time the centering operation was more delicate. The image grew until it filled a quarter of the screen. We stared at it in fascination. It showed up in stark silhouette, in the electronic light of the radar scope. Two perfect disks, joined by a fine filament. As we watched, their relative position slowly shifted one moving across, half occluding the other. As the image drifted, Miller worked with infinite care at his console to hold it on center, in sharp focus. "'Wish you'd give me an orbit on this thing, Joyce,' he said, "'so I could lock onto it.' "'It ain't got no orbit, man,' Joyce said. "'I'm tracking it, but I don't understand it. That rock is on a closing curve with us, and slowing down fast.' "'What's the velocity, Joyce?' I asked. "'Averaging about one thousand relative, Captain, but slowing fast.' "'All right. We'll hold our course,' I said. I keyed for a general announcement. "'This is the Captain,' I said. "'General quarters. Man action stations and prepare for possible contact within one hour. Missile section, arm number one battery, and stand by.' Then I added, we don't know what we've got here, but it's not a natural body. Could be anything from our torpedo on up." I went back to the beam screen. The image was clear, but without detail. The two disks slowly drew apart, then closed again. "'I'd guess that movement is due to rotation of two spheres around a common center,' Clay said. "'I agree with you,' I said. Try to get me a reading on the mass of the object." I wondered whether Kramer had been locked up as I had ordered, but at this moment it seemed unimportant. If this was, as I hoped, a contact with our colony, all our troubles were over. The object—I hesitated to call it a ship—approached steadily, still decelerating. Now Clay picked it up on the televideo, as it paralleled our course forty-five hundred miles out. Captain, it's my guess the body will match speeds with us at about two hundred miles at his present rate of deceleration, Clay said. 
hold everything you've got on him, and watch closely for anything that might be a missile," I said. End of chapter 1, part 1